to the machines, but I, I guess mechanical engineering is a broader subject. At least I was concerned with just everything that went on and not any great deal in any particular thing, I guess. Yeah. Whereas wind concentrated on the concentrated radio, on, on the radio uh, yeah. uh, frequency generation and its tremendous powers and so on. Yeah. Well, uh, fine then, Jane. Let's see. Um, have you actually started? Uh, I've actually started it. What's that? Yeah, I've started. Well, I, we usually just started. Uh, before we uh, start, I usually just run off uh, some tape so that uh, uh, if there are any flaws on, say, the first mm -hmm. twenty-five feet, I don't uh, encounter those. Yeah. Uh, so, did you press the the, the um, press record? Yeah. No, I meant the, the, the counter yet. Oh, that's a good point. Um, it's reset, is it? Yeah, where it says reset, you just press push it, it in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it at zero now? Yeah. All right. Yeah, well, do we'll you think we could stop it and rerun it just a minute? Just a sure. Minutes. All right. Sure. Fine. Let's just. Uh, Stop this now and uh, and rerun just to make sure that we're uh, and then I will say uh, uh, please uh, uh, please proceed and then at that time uh, if you just say that uh, say well that uh, most people say the uh, where they were born and had their early education and then what their uh, college was and the, you know the general thing and then. Uh, then I'll chime in from time to time and ask questions right. and, well, and, and make it very, uh, very yeah. informal. I may take a lot of prompting. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Now I, I think once we get started here, <laughs> about ready to go. All right. Fine then. Uh, so we, we will just. Uh, well, uh, it's a uh, sure a pleasure being with you here today, uh, Bill, and uh, uh, to uh, have you uh, add to our uh, history of science and technology. And uh, this, uh, your experiences uh, uh, with the early work with uh, with E.O. Lawrence on the cyclotron will furnish us a, a vital link in the uh, in the development of uh, of this aspect of uh, science and technology. And uh, so I would we'll, we should make this very informal. And so at this particular time, I would like to uh, uh, say that. Uh, We'll uh, start the videotaping, so uh, uh, please proceed, Bill. Okay. Well, I, I guess you'd like to hear a little bit of my early life. Very good. <laughs> uh, I was born in Berkeley, where we are right now, and of course where the University of California originated yeah. and where the Cyclotron Laboratories have been. Uh, I, uh, my father was an attorney in San Francisco uh, who was... Uh, Left, they went through the earthquake, and uh, he moved to Berkeley right after the earthquake, and that's where I was born. And a couple of years later, uh, <clears throat> I went to, to the grade schools here, and uh, and uh, then the Stanford. Uh, I've always wanted to be an engineer. I've always liked mechanical things, and there was never any question in my mind <laughs> about what my, I should do. Uh, so you had determined on the field of engineering at a fairly early age. Oh yes, I think probably six or seven years old, oh, something yes. like that. that I that's very interesting. Used to play with mechano outfits. Yeah, I was fascinated by them, and, and I wired up light bulbs and that sort of thing. Too. Yeah. Well, as a matter of fact, I imagine uh, a, a lot of um, engineers got their start in the, the mechano sets, the chemistry yes. sets, and so on. Yes, and days. physicists. Chemists too, I say. Yes. Yes. Uh, I uh, went to Stanford as uh, undergraduate work, and uh, uh, in the engineering school, and uh, uh, that uh, had, it was pretty broad education at Stanford, uh, for which I'm very thankful. Yeah. It didn't concentrate nearly as much as many schools do on the technical things. And, and I, I, after graduating in 1930, I went to work for a manufacturer of what had been steam automobiles <laughs> in the area, which was a fascinating subject. And, and uh, after about a year of that, I went back to MIT for a master's degree, which took me two years and uh, gave me a good uh, view of the differences between MIT and Stanford. Oh, I, yes. I can't help thinking that Stanford had the edge. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Uh, then I came back to the West and uh, worked for some more time with that uh, company.
company uh, at that time, they were developing a, a, a type of steam uh, power car, which was uh, to be run on the railroads in competition with the diesel engines, which were just then coming on oh, yeah. to the use. And there was some hope that the steam might still be competitive with the diesel. Well, as time went on, that hope grew weaker and weaker. <laughs> and so I finally left them and uh, was just somewhat at a loose end. And I was looking around and uh, was getting ideas. I went to the university library and happened to run on an article on the cyclotron by Franz Curry, who I know of. Yes, what year was that? That was, that was 37. 37. Yes, and uh, I was, uh, the cyclotron sounded very intriguing, but what impressed me most was that I could understand the equations oh, yes. <laughs> of the resonance. And oh, so yes. I, <laughs> and, and realizing or reading that it was right there in the next building, practically, I went over to see what was going on and met Don Cooksey. And uh, that was the building that was the old, uh, had been the mechanical engineering laboratory for the university, but the, it had been... It had been turned over to the to Professor Lawrence at that time for the, as the cyclotron laboratory. Yes, what what size was the cyclotron? That it was twenty seven inches. Oh, that was, was twenty seven inches. Yes, and it was built out of the uh, out of a big magnet that had been used for radio transmitter and, uh, and was, which had been donated to the university. And the cyclotron had been around then, you see, for I guess since nineteen thirty or thirty one. There it was six or seven years old and. Uh, so it was, in some ways, yeah. <laughs> a fairly mature business, yeah. although you wouldn't know it from the way yeah. <laughs> people were acting. And, and uh, <clears throat> so I, uh, Don I, I seemed to feel that I could be useful. I, fortunately, I wasn't in a position where I had to have a job, so I was able to sort of to, to contribute my time to the operation. And, and uh, so as uh, Ernest was away at the time, but uh, he said that when Ernest came back, he could tell me whether I could actually work there or not. And so a few days later, Ernest did come back. And, and I talked to him, and he seemed to be pleased to have somebody who at least uh, <laughs> was called an engineer on the job. I, at that time, I'm not sure whether Wynne Salisbury was there or not, but they were. The 60-inch cyclotron was being designed at the time. 30, the 27-inch cyclotron was just about to be replaced with a 37-inch tank. Oh, yes. And that was a big step forward because up to that time, all the, uh, the tanks had been sealed with wax. Oh, yes. <laughs> the, well, <laughs> yes, that was uh, pretty true, uh, although a tremendous amount of good work was done on that. That's right. Uh, and the, the, uh, the idea of science, uh, which I had never paid a great deal of attention to science. As you know, I've taken science courses and so on, but I've never had any idea of being a scientist and still don't. I'm an engineer, but but uh, it was, you know, the whole activity there was just discovering things <laughs> and the best, you might say. And I, as I, uh, one of the things that I noticed, everybody noticed, was a big isotope chart of big board on the wall and it had hooks on it for the labels for the isotopes that are being discovered. Oh know? yeah, <laughs> well uh, I guess at that particular time uh, the uh, new radioactive isotopes uh, would come by about one a week or they, something. Oh, at, at least I guess and, and uh, I know when the uh, physical review came out, I think it came out weekly at that time, I know, at least some edition of it, I'm not sure, but uh, they uh, they, uh, one of the physicists would would <coughs> read what the isotopes had been discovered as the last issue and, and make labels to hang on this chart. And a good many of these labels are discoveries that are made right there in that laboratory. <laughs> that's, uh, well, that's a fascinating story. Uh, yes. That, uh, it was obvious that science was being, uh, <laughs> was advancing right before my eyes yeah. there. <laughs> And uh, the people were very anxious, of course, to keep the machine running on the bombardments. And uh, uh, so they, I was interested in the machine. I, I didn't take any, you know, have much to do with the isotopes of the science. I was, but, but I didn't do that part of it. But 
I like the machine as being a complicated electromechanical device, and uh, so I was just given more and more uh, to do in keeping the machine running, so that the physicists were more relieved of that and could work on their experiments. Yes. Well, I imagine that uh, good engineering uh, would uh, help to uh, keep uh, that machine running a greater percentage of the time. I imagine that some of the early machines must have had a tremendous amount of downtime. Well, they, they, that's true. It, it didn't have to be especially good engineering, just engineering. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, the, the physicists uh, looked at the apparatus as any kind of apparatus. You know, it's, it's made just for the experiment, and they don't consider it, it has to keep running particularly. Uh, usually, the, when the experiment's over, even though the, the machine is about, about about to collapse, nobody cares because yeah. the work has been done. But in the case of cyclotron, there was so much further use for it that reliability did have some significance, and and uh, of course that was made things go more slowly when you had to do a better job. However, I didn't I didn't object to that at all. Although the physicists would want to get on with their experiment, they didn't care if the machine fell apart yes. <laughs> after they finished or yes, not. Yeah, so that was a characteristic. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, so uh, that, it was just great. I enjoyed that very much. So you have uh, then. Uh, uh, you participated then uh, in the design and construction of the uh, of the 50 inch uh, machine. Well, uh, yes, it was. At the, it's interesting that you mentioned 50 inch because it was known as a 60 inch. Oh, I it see. was I'm 60 sorry. inches, 60 but it inch. it started life as a 50 inch machine. And if you don't mind the long winded story, well, I, uh, this, no, this uh, they, uh, when when I a few weeks after I got to the laboratory, uh, the 37 inch vacuum chamber was pulled out and the, and the 27 inch was pulled out and the 37 inch was put in. And that was the first one to use gaskets like ordinary engineering design do. I had nothing to do with the design of it. It designed before I got there. But it was quite a break, you know, quite a departure to use rubber gaskets because rubber was under suspicion in vacuum systems anyway. And uh, <coughs> so when it was first pumped down, the pressure stayed high as most new machines do. And, and uh, it seemed that physicists were beginning to worry about whether they could get a vacuum with these rubber gaskets. And uh, they were talking about replacing, pulling the tank apart and waxing it. Oh, yes. <laughs> and, uh, but after the next, the second week, a uh, week of pumping, and the second week, the pressure began to come down. It came down very well, and everybody was just the euphoria. Oh, you know? yes. And uh, they were, uh, Ernest Lawrence was so enthused that he thought not, we should everything is so great, let's increase the 50-inch cyclotron to 60 inches. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but you did. Yeah. How did you, uh, uh, well, uh, did you have to redesign the magnets? And well, he, that was, you know, the way he operated, and he said, uh, you know, you can do it all right. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, that was the way it always was. He seemed to have so much confidence in people's ability that they yeah. just sort of rose to the occasion. Well, I don't remember that there was any great problem because I don't think the iron had been uh, uh, they started manufacturing it yet. But but uh, we did change the drawings. There was a draftsman who worked for the WPA, which was active at that oh, time, yeah. and uh, and uh, he uh, got uh, got a new piece of paper and started a oh, new yeah. drawing for the mm -hmm. 60 inch cyclotron, oh, yeah. which is what it turned out to be. Who made the uh, magnet? For the 60 inch, mm -hmm. uh, as I recall, it was the United States Steel, at the, oh, yes. and it uh, the uh, it was machined, I believe, at the Moore uh, shipyard. Oh yes, yes. Well, that was quite uh, uh, quite a landmark at that time to get a 60 inch cyclotron. Yes, and it was designed uh, more carefully and to to keep running as the. Uh, up to that time, things have been sort of like laboratory experiments. This is more like a piece of laboratory equipment, you might say. So uh, that, uh, as far as the sources and everything else is concerned, uh, once you finished a run, you could get back into operation pretty quickly. Then. Oh yes, it was. There were it had some very good features. It, uh, the uh, the control was very simple, and uh, it, it was possible for. Uh, 
uh, to shut down the cyclotron, and if everybody had to go to class, say, they could shut it down, and then an hour later, they could come back and turn it on. Oh, yeah. In the later years, it would get to be such an operation to turn on the cyclotron, and yeah. it would take an hour to turn it on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but Ed McMillan worked out a control system for that, like, you know, to turn it on and off that was very effective. Oh, yes. Well, let's see. Uh, that had the, uh, and then you had to uh, design uh, the uh, radio frequency system uh, yes. to, uh, to go with the uh, 60 inch second. Yes, Wynn Salisbury uh, had a lot to do with that. He built the oscillator for the cyclotron in the big, big uh, aluminum box with the homemade tubes in it, uh, the big power tubes that were made there at the laboratory. They were the ones that uh, Dave Sloan and uh, had developed for the X-ray tube over in the San Francisco hospital, which had been in development of several years earlier. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> we had a couple of high-power tubes uh, that had been sent out, I think, from uh, Western Electric uh, that uh, we might use. I guess they were donated or something, but <laughs> they, they were unrepairable. And nobody wanted to try them oh, because yeah. if they damaged them, they would be uh, they'd be gone. And that's uh, whereas the, the homemade tubes are repairable; they were taken apart and fixed. Oh yes, and uh, put back together again. Of course, they they didn't uh, they weren't I guess awfully good tubes, but they were made right there in the shops and worked on. So they're much more economical. In fact, money was very short in those days. Yes, approximately what power. Um, uh, those, well, I, uh, I think they were like 100 that. kilowatt oh, tubes, yeah. uh, they're big tubes that took a lot of power from yes. the cyclotron. Well, a kilowatt vacuum tube used to be considered. Oh, a yes, these were, vacuum tube. these were the highest, uh, among the highest power tubes that, uh, that had been built up to the time. Oh, yes. Fine. Well, then, uh, apparently, uh, then the 60 inch cyclotron uh, operated. Uh, uh, very well. Uh, uh, what was the, uh, uh, how soon after was the, the next step up? In, uh, well, uh, <coughs> when the 60 inch uh, got into uh, steady operation, Ernest uh, uh, began thinking, or at least yeah. he began talking, he'd probably been thinking about it before, on the next cyclotron. And uh, this was the one that uh, became the 184 inch. Oh, yeah. and, uh, uh, he uh, <coughs> raised money for it uh, through the Rockefeller Foundation, and I think another a couple of other smaller foundations. I, mean, I think the university contributed also. I can remember Warren Weaver coming out and visiting and uh, talking about this the great cyclotron, as oh, yeah. <laughs> Ernest <laughs> tended to call it. And uh, it was obviously too big to put the uh, near the, where the 60 inch and the 37 inch was down on the campus. There wasn't that much room, so uh, we, uh, I remember we went on a site expedition and uh, settled on a uh, spot above the big sea on the hill uh, that the students and the oh, yes. sea for California, and just, there was a knoll just behind that letter, and uh, that's where the cyclotron uh, was put. That was the designated site for the 184 inch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> that was, uh, of course, the war was beginning to uh, come closer about that time. And uh, we were, I was working on drawings of the, of the uh, coils and the uh, magnet. And uh, we had a magnet test set up. And Emilio Segre was working on that. And Charlton Cooksey, Don Cooksey's brother was out or I guess sabbatical or something and he worked on the magnet design and, and uh, uh, <coughs> uh, we things are going fairly steadily it was as I remember it was to be 100 MeV uh, a proton and uh, uh, about the time the magnet was on order all the, all the steel was on order and copper uh, the paper by uh, Beta came out in the Physical Review on the theory of the cyclotron, which I don't think Berkeley people would pay much attention to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and this was a uh, uh, analyzing of the, the acceleration, the D voltage required to keep the 
particles in, in resonance, and uh, of course, uh, as the relativistic increase in mass occurred at higher energies, the particles tended to get farther out of re resonance, and so that could only be overcome by reducing the number of revolutions, which meant more voltage. Oh, yeah. So there was a relation between energy and voltage, and I, I recall the voltage went up as the square of the energy, the d voltage required. Yes. And, and uh, Beta, in his concluding paragraph, said that considering the difficult the problems of higher voltage and the rapid increase, that it didn't look like cyclotrons would be practical above about 25 MeV at the time oh, yes. you're working on 100. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> no, that, that's interesting. Uh, well, let's see, uh, was. Uh, uh, was there, uh, did you resort to anything like uh, shimming or anything like that to help uh, the relativistic uh, problem? Well, uh, uh, I guess the answer is no. Uh, there was shimming done, uh, but uh, this was a shock to the laboratory. And uh, at that time, Bob Wilson was a graduate student and was writing a paper on the cyclotron, which paralleled Beta's paper, and uh, it said the same thing, effectively, although he didn't conclude the yeah. same thing, but uh, there was no question about the theory. That was, <laughs> couldn't get around that. Uh, so, Ernest uh, had the cyclotron redesigned for deuterons, mm -hmm. and instead of protons, which, of course, uh, have less increase in mass for the same total energy. Yeah. And uh, uh, he wanted the D voltage to be a million volts. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Yeah. Well, there there was a X, the X-ray tube in the San Francisco hospital was running at a million volts, and uh, so it wasn't absurd. It was oh, yeah. difficult, and uh, uh, I guess everybody was felt pretty uh, worried about it. But that the gap of the cyclotron was increased to uh, get more D to ground clearance and. Uh, and of course, that reduced the magnetic field, but the redesign was for 100 MeV deuterons and with a large gap and a very high D voltage. But that's about then that work was shut down because of the war. Oh, yes. When was uh, so then the conversion uh, from that uh, to isotope separation was necessary? Yes. And what uh, I guess that must have been almost coincident with the outbreak of war, was it? Well, uh, I'm not quite sure really about the dates, but the war was getting closer all yes. the time. And uh, I think about six months before Pearl Harbor, at least six months, we were working pretty much on a war basis at the laboratory. Oh, yes. Uh, because it, it was known that the, you know, the uh, bomb project was uh, a possibility and uh, they were getting money to support the work there at Berkeley. And I, uh, I started working on that uh, uranium separation, which was, of course, yeah. the thing that we, uh, we were assigned and we, we worked on. And the 184 inch magnet uh, was uh, uh, under construction. In fact, uh, its first construction, the first erection of steel had been, uh, was before the war. Things, I can remember that as being sort of relaxed. We were up there watching what was going on on the hill. And oh, yeah. They had to drill. 10,000 holes, or burned 10,000 holes in the plates that we built the equipment for. So on, it made out of plates and and, and uh, big discs of steel, and, and the quality, the flatness of the plates was important because the whole thing would be pretty irregular if they didn't get flat plates. And as the time went on, the plates got worse and worse, and uh, because they were the steel mills were being pushed so hard to get war materials out, and uh, we finally the Unfortunately, the most critical plates were the worst ones, so they were closest to the poles, because that was what was assembled last. And we were talking about rejecting them, and they said, you can reject them, but you'll never get any more. Oh. <laughs> so we took them, <clears throat> and Ernest was usually, uh, as, as usual, was very relaxed about many of these tolerances. He, I mean, he, the, the typical engineer like myself tries to do everything just as well as he can, but <laughs> in many cases, I, it, it's not practical and not uh, desirable to try to prove one thing. Good enough is good enough. There's no use putting it. Doing more, so we, we uh, took the plates, and uh, by that time, I guess the war was uh, very, we were, must have been in it, or we were, it must have been after Pearl Harbor. And uh, <laughs> the magnet was then uh, completed, 
and uh, used for the uranium separation process for experimenting. It, it ran uh, all through the war with a gap six feet high. You could walk through it if oh, you're not if you're too tall, yeah. and ran it at uh, 3,500 gauss. And it had there were two test crews working on uranium separators, uh, one on each side of the magnet the platform up there, because the pole piece was uh, the bottom of the pole was maybe six feet off the floor. And so there was a, a, a workbench, I mean a control bench, a control desk at each side, and, and a crew of people was working on each side of the magnet, they, and the magnet stayed on all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, they used non-magnetic tools and, and just worked in the magnetic field. Yes, now, uh, you see, uh, the other two cyclotrons, uh, were they uh, also adapted for uh, other experiments in isotope yes. separation? Uh, uh, yes, they were they were used well, not all in isotope separation. I wasn't uh, very close to, to what was going on 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 them. Uh, they before the hundred well before we uh, actually the work moved up to the hill. Uh, we uh, ran the uh, thirty-seven inch cyclotron as a as a uh, mass spectrograph separator, and uh, that was one in which we. <laughs> Well, I can remember definitely Ernest asking me to start in making an ion source for this thing. Oh, yeah. You know? And, and uh, it was such a change because there was no radiation. You could get right up and close to things. Oh, you know? yeah. <laughs> they move all the shielding out. Mm -hmm. And uh, we uh, we had a shutdown date uh, uh, set. Uh, and uh, when this equipment was to go in, I think it took about two weeks to design it. It was very simple. And I remember Frank Oppenheimer was working on a, on a uh, thesis uh, right up to the last hour and trying to get some data on a lot of equipment that was in the cyclotron. And uh, he, when the time came to shut it down, he just kept right on working, tearing it apart, and building the new equipment. He worked all night and uh, put the, started putting the new equipment in for the mass separator for the run the next morning. Oh, yes. <laughs> it was, it of course, under great time pressure. Everybody realized the importance of that. And so we, uh, we got a beam of uh, uranium atoms and... and uh, uh, they were. It worked uh, quite a bit better than <laughs> a lot of people expected. They, they uh, convinced uh, the theory was that you wouldn't be able to get appreciable currents because of space charge spreading of the beam. But it turned out that there was enough dirt in the tank to produce electrons that, that neutralized the beam. And they were trapped by the magnetic field, so that you did the beam didn't blow up the way it had been anticipated. And As I understand that. Uh, Calculations were made that uh, if, you, if you got more than one uh, microamp of uranium, uh, that it would blow up. Uh, well, it should if it hadn't been for this uh, gas, uh, you know, focusing. I guess you'd call yeah. it that. Uh, uh, that would have, but that that did save it. And but uh, still, the beam was small. It was you know uh, from a production standpoint, yeah. it was awfully small, and, yeah. and it. But they earnest. But you were getting into the, at least the milliamps. That's there. right, yes. Uh, I don't remember what we got on the first runs, but uh, I remember we had a, a meter that was called a super sensitive <laughs> yes. meter or something yeah. that had written on the top of it. Then oh, we yeah. read it. It was in a big box. That's what we started out with. And uh, one of the first, uh, in the first few weeks, we, had to, we made a run uh, to, see, to collect a sample. Uh, to make for measurements that are being made by somebody on, I don't know, a neutron proficient or something. And uh, <coughs> I can remember uh, running all night on that with a group of people, and we wanted it took about 24 hours, I think, to get enough material on the target to, to uh, for their purpose at the beam current that we were able to get. And when they, we finished the run, we took out the target, and it was nothing on it at all. It had been sputtered off as fast as it oh, yeah. landed. Yeah. <laughs> well, this was obvious when you saw it. <laughs> yeah. So that the, we had to immediately make a target that caught the uranium on the bounce, which was what was used from then on. But it shows how yeah. <laughs> the kind of thing that happened. 
And then after that, uh, shortly after that, uh, we moved up the, to the, side, the hill that's above the big sea where the cyclotron magnet was being finished, and, and that's where most of the work went on. And the, the 37 inch was then used for studies on the on the ion source and ionization uh, arc discharges by a group of Englishmen eventually, which who uh, worked quite a long time on that. Yes, I believe. Uh, didn't uh, Oliphant uh, join? Uh, Yes, he was at, about this time also. Well, late, it was later in the war, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what happened in the first year or so, but uh, when this group came over from England, uh, Elephant was there, and Massey was the one who worked at, on the 37 inch with three mm -hmm. or four Englishmen. The 60 inch worked also, but I think they were doing mostly measurements of, uh, that weren't directly connected with the uranium separation. I didn't have much contact with the 60 inch after that. Yes, well, those um, uh, the existence of uh, of those machines uh, made it possible to cut years off of the uh, mass uh, uh, production of uh, mass spectrograph material. Well, so, uh, yes, but the real key to it was the presence of Ernest Lawrence. I think. Yes, that's <laughs> right. Not only equipment, but the brains there. Well, and the enthusiasm. And the inspiration. Yes, yes, I read uh, what I could about other countries' uh, mm -hmm. efforts, and uh, they didn't have an Ernest Lawrence. <laughs> yes. Well, fine. Uh, that incidentally, of course, uh, uh, now that you uh, were able to, do, to design the, the 184, of course, the next step was for, for production. And who got the concepts of the vertical uh, deeds and the racetracks and so forth and so on? I was wondering if you could elaborate that mm. on the next step uh, that well, uh, uh, was taken uh, in, uh, in making a production operation for U-235. Well, I can tell you what we, uh, something of what went on. Uh, of course, the, it was realized that it would take a lot of mass separators mm -hmm. because even though know, the up output in, would increase, it, it still was going to take mm -hmm. probably hundreds of these things and multiple arcs. And so uh, we, uh, I guess I made some sketches, early sketches, and, and Wally Reynolds, an electrical engineer who shepherded laboratory projects uh, from the, originally from the ground to buildings department, and then he later joined the laboratory. Uh, and I tried to make up some cost estimates, which were way off, uh, way too low <laughs> for what it was going yeah. to amount to. And then the, uh, the, uh, uh, Stone and Webster Engineering Company, uh, Westinghouse, and General Electric are brought into the mm -hmm. project, and uh, they brought engineers to Berkeley. And uh, so between all these engineers, by then there were maybe a hundred engineers mm -hmm. working on the job, and the, these ideas generated. And most mm -hmm. of these were very good people and had lots of ideas. And, oh yes. And just where the idea of the racetrack came, I don't remember. Wilson mm -hmm. Powell was. Uh, in charge of magnet, magnetic measurements, and all all these schemes were made in little model magnets. And I can remember that we had the question of whether to use a you know a long stack of a solenoid effectively with alternate coils and and cores, and then the mass uh, the vacuum tank in between. That that probably just generated just sort of developed as more or less obvious thing the way to do it. But there's a question whether to make it a complete racetrack or whether to just let the field, the printing, the field return through the air because you didn't, it didn't take a lot of iron on the end to bring the reluctance down to the point where you could just let the, you know, you didn't have to have a return path. Yeah. And, uh, but the, the, of course, the question was, could you work in all this field, this stray field, which might be 20 gauss mm -hmm. or 50 gauss and everything would be oh, yeah. moving around. And, so that it was decided to close the ends. And yeah. on the racetracks, the, uh, the material, uh, of course, was a very, very uh, critical and so much of it was being used for other war mm -hmm. efforts. And of course, somebody had the idea of using silver. I don't know who it was instead of the copper, which was a very good idea. And uh, I know we had a steel cast cores, the, the field uh, spank was only 3,500 gauss, so the cores only had to be about 20% iron, and the, the 
carry the flux. So we had cores made of sort of egg crates of steel, and I know they ran into a, a, a problem with the shipyards because they were making steel castings for ships, and, and where we were, this was coming from, I think Utah, and uh, they were the real bottleneck. But we we were able to <laughs> get the the priority to get these castings, but. Uh, <coughs> later designs of magnets, the Alpha II designs, were made out of sheet metal, just solid, because that, there was plenty of sheet rolling capacity oh, yeah. in the country that wasn't being used for automobiles yeah. and refrigerators and things like oh, that. Yeah. So that's how they, even though it was very inefficient from the standpoint of the use of iron, it was made better use of the production facilities. Oh, yes. That, uh, incidentally, do you remember when it became uh, apparent that uh, there would be two stages necessary to reach the proper concentration of U-235, or was that apparent right from the start? Yeah. I think it must have been apparent from the start, because, uh, I, of course, we this need-to-know yeah. limitation always kept yeah. us from even asking about yeah. what were what plans were, yeah. you know, what, but I, I can't believe, I, we didn't know what the required purity was, and I never did know, I guess, I was probably read it in later I, I, years, but, but uh, it seemed to me it was, it was sort of taken for granted that there had to be more than one stage. So, an uh, alpha unit and a beta unit. Uh, yes, it was uh, fortunate that it could be done in two stages. Yes, yeah, that's right, uh, because if it had to be uh, another stage with all of the inherent complications and losses. Well, they get smaller as you go along, but anyway, it was... Uh, of course, the beta stage had the problem of conserving the material, yes. and that made it, there was a big chemical problem there. They had to dissolve an awful lot of the machinery. Oh, yes. I, 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 I'm, very, I'm very familiar with that part of it. Yes. I had very little to do with the beta design. Uh, almost all of the work I did was on alpha, and then uh, we, uh, uh, later on, uh, the when the Alpha equipment was designed, and it, uh, it was very quickly done, it seems to me, in retrospect, uh, and <coughs> the, uh, I went with the group to Oak Ridge. Well, actually, uh, it, as you, well, you, you were there. You remember when the magnets shorted oh, and all oh, that. Oh, yes. I, and, that, that, those were and, some very dark days. Yes. Uh, and and there. Ken McKenzie uh, suggested that to Ernest that he sent a group of people from Berkeley, so I was one of that group, and uh, to start up a group of tanks in the uh, Alpha One plant. And uh, I, these tanks came on uh, very, very well. I you probably were there. Probably. Yes, I was. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember how uh, uh, there was a pessimism there that they would <laughs> really ever be able to to uh, solve that uh, yeah. shortage problem. But uh, fortunately, uh, cleared up with heroic efforts. Oh, and they were heroic, all right. I, the shorting of the magnets was not a, you know, that wasn't fundamental. I think it was, it, uh, there wasn't too much question, at least in my mind, that it could be fixed. But whether the, the calutron would actually work in a, as a practical matter, I think, was a question. Yeah. You know? And uh, it hadn't worked very well up to the time the magnet was yeah. it shorted out. And of course, the magnet shorting didn't occur suddenly. It was a gradual thing. The yes. dirt accumulated. But they, I can see that the uh, operating people, the Tennessee Eastman people, were, could be very discouraged with what they found out prior to the time the magnet went bad. And so I, I've always often thought that Ken McKenzie made a real contribution in recommending that we make uh, start the 16 tanks, I think it was. Oh, yes. We ran back there. Well, I got came down with jaundice just about the time we had got running, and so oh, I yes. was out of commission for quite a while. But uh, so that is uh, up to, that is about the end of my participation in oh, the yes. project. Uh, well, once they uh, once they got going past that point, of course, the operation was very successful. Yes, it did. And uh, came on right uh, right on right on schedule. Fact, well, it it get, it improved steadily. It, it, it was a, a near thing that it actually got enough material for the yeah. bomb <laughs> yes. in time to make it useful. Because mm -hmm. Another year would have been uh, probably too late. Yes, well, that was uh, actually, uh, I believe uh, E.O. Lawrence said we've got to have it very early in the year. We've got to have it by 
July of 1945, and it came right on schedule at that point, although yeah. they almost had to sweep up every milligram in order to get it, to well, get it up. Yeah, yeah. Well, well then, uh, so, uh, well, of course, the, the rest is all well, uh, well-known well history, uh, and uh, with the completion of this, then, uh, uh, presumably you would turn your attention to... Uh, other things uh, at the radiation laboratory. Yes, uh, uh, I was. Uh, my wife and I and daughter lived in the Oak Ridge for about. It seems to me about nine months. Uh, but we were there wasn't much we were, I couldn't accomplish much. Everything yeah. was in the hands of the operators by that time. And oh yeah. It was a different period in the development. Uh, and uh, <coughs> I remember Ernest coming uh, visiting us one evening and. Uh, he was discussing the future of the laboratory post-war. Yeah. People were beginning to talk about what's going to happen after the war. And he thought that the lab should have about six engineers. Oh, yes. <laughs> and I, I said in some notes I wrote that uh, I think it seldom went below 60. <laughs> yeah. Probably more like 600. Yes, <laughs> uh, with all of the uh, things that uh, were then uh, started, uh, yes. uh, full-scale engineering effort needed yes. at every stage. In fact, some of them could not have been done uh, without systematic engineering. No, but of course that's what systematic, what engineering is supposed to be. Uh, we were on the way back when the bomb actually fell in, in, in Hiroshima. And uh, they, when I got back to the laboratory, we were driving back. We had enough gas tickets were given to us to drive across. And uh, <coughs> we when it came to the laboratory, everybody was reading the Smythe report. They were just, oh, yes. every place you look, people were reading the Smythe report, which we hadn't, I hadn't seen before we arrived in Berkeley. But apparently it had been handed out the day before or something. Oh, yeah. and it was interesting that everything stopped uh, for that. And then uh, I think that the lab was back on a peacetime basis in about one week. Ernest Lawrence just, you know, do this and that and the other thing and get going, you see. <laughs> and, yes. and there wasn't, the, there was hardly any transition period at all. Like, uh, and everybody was, you know, welcomed that they, many of the lab, uh, laboratory people were only working there during the war. I remember the chief draftsman we had was a, it was a bridge teacher. He went back to teaching bridge. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> but he was a good chief draftsman too. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, Louis and Ed came from Los Alamos, and uh, uh, Bob Thornton had been with Tennessee Eastman. You know, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as I, uh, they, they all had ideas. Of course, Ernest wanted to get the cyclotron running again, and uh, Ed and Bexler, you know, and uh, uh, discovered the space stability that existed in. Uh, the frequency modulated cyclotron, and uh, so that uh, that was uh, pretty obviously the thing to get look into with the cyclotron because it's million volt proposition <laughs> of yes. four years before yes. <laughs> looked worse all the time. Yes, and <laughs> Louis uh, uh, wanted to build a, a proton linear accelerator. Uh, he uh, uh, linear accelerators had been were being talked about. I think Slater at MIT was. About to build one, or talking about one, and, and uh, <coughs> so, and then Ed McMillan wanted to build the synchrotron to, to use this mm -hmm. phase stability as for an accelerating electron, and so Ernest, of course, was enthusiastic about all of them, oh, <laughs> and, yes. uh, and there seemed to be plenty of money, uh, you know, and, uh, yes. and so uh, they three three crews were laid out. I was concerned with the cyclotron. And, uh, uh, two of the other engineers, uh, Aidan Gordon and Marvin Martin, worked on the LINAC and the synchrotron. Mm -hmm. And uh, so LINAC, uh, <coughs> uh, Pete Panofsky worked uh, for Louis on the, on the LINAC, and of course he was very productive. Oh, yes. <laughs> and, uh, and about a, a month or so after they started, Louis announced that it was. No longer a proton lineage, it is now an electron lineage. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, oh, I'm sorry, maybe it's the other way around. Yeah, that's right, it's the other way around, I guess. But 
Were they converted from it, electron? Uh, well, it, it uh, wasn't actually built yet. It was just they were just planning. Yeah, it ended up with a the proton went out. Uh, <coughs> what but, voltages were they planning to go to? Well, that was a 32 million volts mm -hmm. uh, for the LINAC. And the, the synchrotron was 300 million electrons. And the cyclotron was, uh, I think it was 200 million volt deuterons oh, yeah. it was designed for. And the, and the uh, Ernest was, uh, I wouldn't say he was skeptical of phase stability, but he, he was very cautious as a, I don't know that people realize that although he was very enthusiastic he was also very cautious oh, yeah. and he was he wasn't going to do anything that he you know start into something that he, where he could make a test for it which he decided to do mm -hmm. and the 37 inch I mean the yes the 37 inch cyclotron was rebuilt the whole pieces were rebuilt to simulate the the uh, uh, a relativistic effect of the 200 MeV deuteron, so that mm -hmm. and, and a rotary condenser was built for it, and uh, it was run to accelerating at, at low energy, but going through a varying magnetic field that simulated the ma mass change, mm -hmm. and it worked, uh, mm -hmm. and that convinced Ernest. Up to that time, up to the time that the 37 inch actually accelerated with the system, why? Uh, uh, we were still working on the, on the original constant frequency design, but we, as soon as it, this 37 inch worked, right, it started over again on what it turned out to be the final, you know, the first time it ran. Yes, well, let's see, what year uh, was the uh, synchrotron finally put into operation? Well, uh, it must have been, let's see, we, it was the summer of 1945 that we started, and uh, I think it was a, probably 47. Uh, the synchrotron had quite a bit of trouble uh, getting started. Uh, due to it's, it had to start as a in the each accelerating cycle as a betatron, mm -hmm. and uh, that the field was so low, the magnetic field was so low. I think it was eight Gauss at the, the end of the, before the radio frequency came on. And, it's very hard to get a uniform field, especially uniform with that low field that is so affected by the residual magnetism and so on. And uh, the machine didn't run for quite a, for some months and had, uh, had a meeting of everybody that knew anything about Betatron. They couldn't get the Betatron part of it to work. And, and uh, I remember Don Kirst was out. And I wasn't very close to their deliberations, but I know they decided that the field was too rough and Wilson Powell set about trimming it with uh, trimming winding, full face winding. Just, uh, just sort of like a, like smoothing it up. Yeah. And uh, so then it did it did accelerate. Once it, the betatron acceleration occurred, then the radio frequency acceleration didn't give any particular trouble. The magnet gave some trouble, uh, which is, turned out to be that the nitrons were too close to the, the switch, the magnet on and off. It wasn't a steady operating magnet, it was pulsed, and it made a, a I think, a, a full cy one cycle with 60 cycles and then stopped. Mm -hmm. So that was, and uh, the, they were big ignitrons, you know, like these, uh, like the big power tubes and the, the, uh, the cables, the conductors that carry the current were too close to the tube, and the magnetic field was affecting the arc inside the tubes. That was one of the things you know, that you can have yeah, a lot of trouble true. with, nobody realized it. Yes. And when they fixed that, well, I think that cleared up the power supply. Yeah, so switching these tremendous currents. Yes. It's never yeah. been done before. Well, I guess not. That accelerator certainly pushed the art of high power electronics. Yes. <laughs> and uh, the cyclotron, uh, that, uh, I can't remember anything. Well, the, the, uh, traumatic thing about it was the fire we had. Uh, the coils were reconnected for the, when the pole, the gap was reduced and they, and uh, I don't know why, well it would have been running at very low field, you see, for the, during the war, 3,500 Gauss and it went up to, I guess around 15,000 mm -hmm. for the cyclotron, so the coils were reconnected and there was a, uh, one of the uh, the lower coils turned
terminals were down at the bottom of the coil. And apparently they'd accumulated dirt over the war years and when the voltage was put on different connectors down there where there was an arc under the oil and the oil caught fire and they couldn't get it out and uh, it was really touch and go because they, there was so much smoke from this oil and it, was, you see the, <laughs> it was coming out of the bottom of the tank oh, and yeah. burning and you, you just and, couldn't get at it <laughs> no it was down in the pit and uh, they Building was filling up with smoke, which was uh, gradually coming down. You know, oh. as it took. But the two engineers, uh, Ken Copenhagen and Cedric Larson, who uh, might be a relative. No, no, I've heard. And uh, they, they were they. Uh, fire extinguishers were no help. They uh, and the fire department came, and they didn't know anything. To, they couldn't do anything. And these two guys got a hold of a hose, a, a regular fire hose, and. And uh, and they just got down in the pit there and turned the hose on and blew it out and I mean right. this yes. brute force did it and they saved the cycle track. Well, um, that was a close call. It was yes. Uh, so uh, I don't uh, it we worked on that it took a, probably a, like about a year and a half or a year to get the to finish the design get it built and get it turned on and. Uh, it ran very nicely. I mean, the uh, uh, <coughs> the uh, first few hours of looking for the beam, uh, it, it didn't work because the the uh, rotary condenser was running too fast. There wasn't enough mm -hmm. D voltage to keep up with it. <laughs> it wasn't developing the D voltage that it yeah. that it should have had. And uh, so, uh, just by somebody thought that maybe that is the trouble and slowed the condenser down and there came the beam. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, was that, that, <laughs> that must have been quite a moment. Right? Yes, that yes it was. Yeah. It was a great moment. And, and that was when, the, I hope I'm on your schedule. Oh yes, yeah, fine, everything. We've got plenty of, <laughs> plenty of time to just relax. <laughs> so well, those are very exciting things there that I yes. never had the picture of before. Yes, uh, uh, then when the cyclotron ran, Ernest gave a party down at Pebble Beach for people that were mostly uh, involved in it. And uh, he, uh, uh, among others, he uh, uh, invited Dr. Robbie out oh, yes. in the East, and there were others in the, in the Rockefeller Foundation and things like that that had put up money. And, uh, <coughs> and uh, uh, about uh, that time, uh, I had been making pictures of the Bevatron, say, because uh, it seemed like the engineering part of a job always gets done, and then there's a gap before the when the thing's being built, and then you're trying to make it work. Well, during this gap, I was thinking about Ed McMillan's ideas and the and the very both the magnetic field and the frequency, which was being discussed, and and uh, I did some calculations on how a big machine could be built that way and and uh, I had uh, made some drawings in fact uh, I guess uh, uh, at Ernest's instigation we uh, published an article in the Review of Scientific Instruments, uh, instruments on a 10 BEV machine just being oh, a nice yes. round number and uh, uh, when we went down to this uh, uh, cyclotron celebration, where Ernest showed these things to Robbie, who was then looking for something for Brookhaven to do. Oh yes. <laughs> well, <coughs> well uh, he uh, Ernest thought they shouldn't take it on anything so <laughs> so far out. Of course, yeah. Ernest talks about other things being far out. Yes, <laughs> that's right. Uh, but yeah. Anyway. He thought they ought to build a cyclotron. Well, Brookhaven did buy a cyclotron, but uh, they wanted to do something more dramatic, obviously. And so, some months later, we, we were called by uh, uh, Jim Fisk, who was in the director of research for the AEC, yeah, oh yes. who told us that Brookhaven was proposing a photon synchrotron to the AEC. Would would Berkeley be interested in doing something like that too? Oh, of yeah. course we were. Time, very timely. <laughs> and uh, so we got out the drawings and uh, made a proposal which uh, uh, was very easy to <laughs> make and, <laughs> and uh, that was the uh, 
basis of the Bevatron project. And uh, the, when we got closer to building it, 10 million volts looked kind of big. <laughs> and so uh, the, the uh, idea of the making uh, anti-protons you know, was, was suggested, as, which required, I remember Panofsky figured out overnight that it took about 5.6 or something BEV. And so yes. about 6 BEV would get you to that threshold. <laughs> And uh, so that was what was suggest selected for the uh, for the uh, energy, and uh, it was 50 feet radius, and I guess 15 kilogauss or iron. It wasn't any uh, pushing things too much, but the thing that was being pushed was the aperture, and uh, that was the big worry whether there was enough aperture. And of course, this is a weak focusing machine. The beam makes a one approximately one cycle mm -hmm. of radial or uh, our vertical oscillation and a revolution, and and uh, the <coughs> the uh, previous machines, the ones we, the last, the, the biggest machines that uh, that we could use for a uh, model, you know, I'd say for which we had any numbers on the space required for the beam were the betatrons and the synchrotrons, which were maybe five feet in diameter, and we're talking about yeah. 100 feet in yeah. diameter. So, and if you scale those up, it was just impossible, because yeah. <laughs> the aperture would have been so big. Well, uh, I remember uh, lots of discussion of what the aperture ought to be, and uh, Alfred Loomis was there at the time. I don't know if you perhaps heard of him. Oh, yes. He a supporter of Ernest. And, he, uh, he, he thought that we ought to make the machine expandable in radius. We ought to build a small machine and then rebuild it larger. And that didn't look good at all. But what we finally decided to do was build a, a machine with, uh, based on the largest aperture that we, that we thought was, I mean, the aperture we thought was really safe, but then provide for reducing that aperture later. So the first... The aperture, that the largest aperture, was to be four feet by, I think, six feet radially, four feet high. See, the boom was kind of, now, yeah. you know, the Fermi lab machine is about like yeah, that. that's right. <laughs> it's a mile in diameter. Yes. But anyway, that's a different story. Yes. But, yes. but so it went ahead on the, uh, uh, the plan was to start out at that large aperture and get about one and a half billion volts, which was still a big yes. number. And, uh, and. Uh, but it would be very relaxed focusing, and, and everybody agreed that that ought to work. And uh, then we could build these, yeah. put in these pole pieces later to reduce it. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we, uh, of course, uh, one of the parts of the uh, Bibitron idea was where to put it, which was an uh, area north of the laboratory uh, called the Wilson Tract, it belonged to the university. Uh, it was beyond the laboratory boundaries north, where it is now, and it's interesting that that was uh, I understood was proposed for the United Nations headquarters. Oh, is that right? <laughs> yes, but but uh, because the nightlife in San Francisco wasn't equal to that in New York, <laughs> we <laughs> saved the yeah. Wilson track for the Babatron. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, uh, there, so they started. Uh, that seemed fine, but they. The area, the terrain was not very <laughs> good. It was yeah. hilly. There was a, in fact, there's a, 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 a ravine, a, a, a creek goes down through there, Blackberry Creek. You've probably heard of Strawberry Creek. Yeah. And the Blackberry Creek is, was north of the canyon. <laughs> and anyway, it, the grading job was quite large to get that flat enough and get an area there. And so while that grading went on, it looked like there was a, we had a time that we could do something else, uh, you know, it didn't look like the building the machine was pressing because it was going to take about a year to get that area graded, so Ernest thought the thing to do was to build a model of the machine, which we did, a, a so-called Bevatron model, it's a quarter-scale model, and uh, we built that machine with the modeling this very large aperture, and <coughs> it was, uh, it, it wasn't too big, you see. It was a well. It, instead of being a hundred feet, it was about twenty-five feet in diameter, and it went to only a low field because uh, it thought that all the trouble, you know, once it would be low field, once you got the beam circulating, you're pretty sure that 
you could keep it there. The, the amplitude of oscillation would die down, and so uh, the aperture problem was going to be worse at the injection period. So we built this model, and uh, it took only nine months to, from the time he decided to build it until it was ready to test. And it did give some trouble. We had some trouble finding the beam in it, getting that, which was due to power supply fluctuations, it turned out. Uh, but uh, it did accelerate, <laughs> so Ernest could <coughs> breathe a little more easily. <laughs> and <coughs> so that was, that was one of the steps in the process. But by the time we'd run the model, and uh, Ernest got more confident, and he, uh, he decided to go to the intermediate aperture. So we decided... What size was the intermediate I think it, it is two feet, as I remember, oh, yes. uh, by whatever the radial width. And so that was the design uh, at the at the time the MTA project started. Yes. Now, the MTA project was at Livermore, and it was a crash secret project mm -hmm. at the time, and it took precedence over the Bevatron. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, and so I, I uh, worked on the MTA project and uh, left the Bevatron to well one particular engineer. I uh, was left in charge of it, who was sort of a caretaker, and uh, they were, we were hiring people for the MTA project, and they were spending there waiting for the security clearance, working on the Bevatron. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, the things didn't go very fast, as you can imagine, and, but we did get the coils wound during that period, that the designs of the coils were all uh, completed, so it was a pretty straightforward job to wind them, and it was done. Uh, on one shift, which uh, had been planned to do more than one shift, so it was done uh, under better conditions and uh, more leisurely. So when the MTA project ended, why well, the mm -hmm. coils were ready. Yes. About how long did you work on the MTA project? Uh, oh, uh, well, I, I imagine that we worked on it uh, actively probably about two years. Oh, yes. But I, you'd have to look at the records, I yeah. Uh, well, I, my recollection is about that time before it became apparent that the uh, needs could be uh, accomplished yeah. with the uh, reactors better. And, uh, yes, they uh, 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 there were lots of problems with that, including the schedule. The schedule was was so short that it was it couldn't be met, and oh, yeah. it was worse than if it had been a longer schedule because people sort of gave up on that. Things got so confused. Yes, it had several setbacks. And uh, but by the time the the MTA, uh, we did leave the MTA project uh, to get back to the Bevatron. Ernest's enthusiasm reached a point where he could go to the smallest oh, apertures. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I wasn't in favor of that, but Ed Lofgren was, and so we had a meeting with Ernest and. Ernest agreed that we ought to go to the smaller aperture. I was, my feet weren't quite as yeah. warm as yeah, <laughs> they might have been. And, uh, and especially as we had everything all going for the smaller, from the larger aperture. But it was very wise to make the change because there wasn't any problem with the larger, with yeah. the smaller aperture. And so it turned on, I guess, about 1954 or like that. It was supposed to turn on about 1951. In the meantime, uh, Brookhaven Cosmotron had been finished and, and uh, turned on and ran well. Uh, it was interesting about naming the Cosmotron and the Bevatron. Uh, when, the, when the project was being uh, considered by the, or I guess after it approved, and uh, Fisk came out to Berkeley with a group from, from uh, Brookhaven uh, to sort of consolidate the design and verify what they're going to do. And, on, and uh, he suggested that it would be good to call these machines, which we now call proton synchrotrons, call them bevatrons. <laughs> Ernest didn't like the word bevatron very much. He, was, he suggested one time cyclodrome, and uh, <laughs> I pointed out that was a <laughs> motorcycle racetrack. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't fly. Right? <laughs> no, but, but uh, we, we had a sort of a, a, a vote, took a vote on names, and Anyway, Bevatron were one out, although in the newspapers it was usually called Betatron because they, 
they cut it deep. They, they never heard of it before. Well, uh, when how many? Let's see. Uh, how many billion volts did that reach? By the, uh, six. Uh, six. Uh, six point four was the nominal uh, design. I think it reached it, uh, which was a margin over the uh, energy required for the. Uh, negative proton, yes. which was observed later on, and, and I think uh, by Segre and Chamberlain and a group of people. But I was going to go on about the name. Uh, uh, they, Brookhaven people at Edward Berkeley agreed to call their machine a Bevatron also, but when they got home, the yeah. people back there wouldn't, yeah. <laughs> didn't agree to it until they, they named it the Cosmotron. Oh, yeah. And uh, of course, well, billion has got two meanings depending on where you are, either 10 to the 9th or 10 to the 12th. Yeah. And so that's not the, it's not a good name anyway, but that's the one that stuck with the Bevatron. Yes, well, so that, uh, you got that one uh, uh, completed and it uh, apparently uh, uh, fulfilled its mission there. Yes, it, it, uh, it was, it's a matter the fact, I think, that the bigger the machines are, the easier they are to design. Oh, yes. They're more expensive and take more people, yes. of course, but the design problems aren't, aren't as difficult. Yes. Well, that, uh, that gave uh, the physicists a, uh, a wonderful tool, then, for exploring the high-energy physics. Uh, yes, and, yes, uh, they made tremendous progress. And, of course, there are many machines now that uh, the strong focusing was a great... Oh, yeah. Alternating gradient focusing was the next breakthrough, which yeah. made the, another step up in size. And, and then uh, in more recent years, the use of colliding beams has mm -hmm. made the available energy just tremendously increase. And, yes. And it's been, every at every one of these stages, it seemed like the next one is just about as far as you could possibly go, and yeah. then something yeah. would happen that it would <laughs> break through to something break much through, more. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, well, that's a far, a far cry from the uh, uh, those uh, first machines of the twenty-seven inch, which uh, got to uh, what is it, uh, uh, ten million volts, or what was that? Uh, oh, I, I no, I couldn't quote it, but yeah. I imagine it's more like six. Yeah. The sixty inch got to about sixteen. Yeah. Uh, and I guess the twenty-seven inch yeah. must have been around ten. Yeah. Well, you had some uh, fascinating uh, engineering experiences uh, yes. living through that whole area of uh, accelerator uh, uh, physics. Uh, and you mentioned that it was not too long after that that you, uh, uh, you decided to broaden out into other fields. Uh, well, I, I thought I'd like to try to do something more on my own. I can't say that it's been very, yeah. <laughs> very impressive, but... Uh, but I don't regret uh, leaving the laboratory. It, the laboratory has changed after Dr. Lawrence's oh, yeah. death, and after the changing conditions, they, you know, they, uh, the site, uh, they couldn't build any bigger machines at oh, Berkeley. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, the uh, Fermi lab machine, of course, was proposed at a, a, a project at Berkeley, but uh, there's hardly a... a it wasn't a very good proposition, the, the proposal that was made here. So I don't uh, really regret leaving the laboratory. It is a great place to have been. And of course, the center of gravity here has moved to Stanford now. And yes, so the, uh, Stanford Lee, I think so. that's, that's really the person that, yeah. that, that's important. And, yeah. And, the, and he, he left the Berkeley because of the loyalty old controversy. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, He's, a, he's a very capable, and uh, that machine there is, a, as you know, is the center of, of uh, research and yes, going and ahead high now energy physics. with the uh, collider. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, tr uh, so that, uh, they've uh, gone ahead tremendously in the, yes. uh, in the voltages uh, that are available for the high energy physics uh, people. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the, uh, uh, some of the engineering uh, projects you've carried out uh, since leaving the uh, well, uh, laboratory. Uh, I don't summarize that, those uh, well, uh, briefly. Uh, uh, so, yeah, we've done uh, work for the various accelerator laboratories, but mostly oh, yeah. it's been uh, things like cost estimating. Oh, yes. Because mm -hmm. we, uh, 
that doesn't uh, that's a field that hadn't been very well developed yes. and, uh, yes. and it became a, a much more uh, much more important since yes. uh, more and more people got into uh, yes. uh, the, the accelerator field. So you participated in quite a number of different uh, uh, accelerator projects as a consultant. Yes. Uh, consulting and services. Yes, then. that's right. Yeah. We've also done some other things. We built a steam engine for a, for a city bus that the state authorized and ran it oh, here yeah. in the area. Mm -hmm. As I had, as, you know, as I mentioned before, Earlier, we I was with a steam power company. Yes, as soon as I got out of school, we uh, developed a point of sale device that's used in McDonald's hamburgers oh, yeah. stores. So <laughs> you've had quite a vari variety of uh, yeah. engineering experiences. Uh, yeah. Yes, so. that's uh, we're, we're now uh, trying to promote uh, get support for. Our, Coal burning railroad locomotive. Oh yes, yeah. that's a, that's interesting. These things are all interesting. Well, that's right things. because uh, the uh, the problem of uh, of oil uh, shortages uh, is always going to be uh, facing us, and uh, and then uh, uh, if in theory you can convert coal coal to oil. But it's an awful lot easier if you burn it directly uh, with the new, yes. new technologies. Well, we it, it's hard to tell what's going to come out. It's, you know, we've seen so many of these developments, and it, all I can conclude is that it's unpredictable yes. what's going to happen. That's right. <laughs> but uh, I don't see how you get there without trying. Yes. And so we, uh, we, we're we trying to get support for that, that type of locomotive that in which uh, you convert the coal to gas right on the locomotive and yeah. then burn the gas. Mm -hmm. And it, it looks like a good way to do it. Well, it looks like well, you had certainly a, a tremendous uh, career in uh, in a lot of uh, uh, a lot of different uh, uh, fields. Uh, uh, however, I guess most most of your career uh, started with the beginnings of accelerators and uh, went almost well, all I, the way through to the yes, I was the modern generation. <laughs> Yes, I was fortunate to be there in the ground floor, you yeah, might say. That's right. And I also was very fortunate to be working under Ernest Lawrence, because, yeah. you know, I can't say too much in yes, praise well, of his. Well, I think uh, all of us who've worked with him uh, feel the same way. It's been, it was a real rewarding experience to be able to work with him. Well, that, uh, I think this has uh, given us a uh, tremendous uh, insight into... Uh, how some of these uh, problems were uh, solved uh, uh, that uh, don't quite all, all appear in the literature, so to speak. And I certainly want to thank you, Bill, for this uh, addition to the, uh, uh, to, the, to the record of uh, science and technology in this field. And uh, I uh, will uh, we'll hope that uh, this, uh, this tape will be of great uh, help to... Uh, uh, to uh, future historians who who want to look into how certain things were developed during this period. Right. I think it's going to be a, a field that uh, historians are going to look into more and more in the future. And I'm certainly glad to do it. I'd like to yeah. give people the benefit of my right. memories of how things actually occurred. <laughs> yes. Well, again, uh, thank you very much, and uh, I'll give you a copy of the tape when, we, uh, when we get them, uh, get it all processed.